that would be me. I think that's my chair. <laughs> No, 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 no. It's fine. I think we should. We're on the same level. Yeah, you sit very low. Keep us separate. No, no, we need to be together. Right there, on the wall. Come on. All right, so everybody, of course, uh, we've got the dastardly duo, Mr. Robert Rustler and Mr. Mark Patton. They're a very fun bunch of guys. Um, so let's try to start it off with something you haven't been asked a million times, okay? Did you know that Nightmare on Elm Street 2 was so gay when you were making it? No, I had no idea. <laughs> well, I'm going to start this off by saying something that like, I'd like to get off my chest right off, off the bat. It's like, I, uh, David Chaskin, is an asshole, and uh, but uh, he's my asshole. I love him. It's like I realized about halfway through what was going on, and I was terrified because I was gay, and the whole question in my career was, could I play straight? And uh, and I mean, you're gay. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, I this started dawning on me, and I was like, oh my god, I'm like in my nightmare now. I mean, I'm in my own nightmare. And, uh, and, and then David said for so many years, and it really pissed me off, and that's why I said that about him, and although I'm really grateful to him in the end, but the thing is, he for years and years and years denied that he had written this as a gay movie. And anytime anybody would ask him, he'd say, oh, well, you know, the guy, he wouldn't even say my name. He'd say, the guy was so gay that he made the movie gay. And my friend was the set designer, and came to me and told me, Look, it was a joke all along. We made, I was putting the props in, and he was doing this, and he was rewriting the script as he went along. And they found me in Mexico, and I said, look, David's a liar. And they brought him back and shot, reshot him, and never sleep again. And that's what he says, and if you watch him, he kind of goes, oh yes, I guess I have to admit it, I did. And so I'm glad that he finally said that, because it was like one of the reasons that I came here was so that people would like that they would go ahead and tell the truth. Because I'm a big old gay thing, but I mean, I also, <laughs> I'm also a good actor, you know what I mean? And it's like, I'm really proud of Nightmare on Elm Street. So, uh, anyway, so that's it. That's it. Now, go ahead and do it. You never really notice the level of the homoerotic tension or just the really funny moments until you watch it in a theater with other people, and, and especially the moment when Jesse says, there's something of me. Or trying to get inside of me. Oh no, it's like there's something inside me and he wants to take me. Oh, okay. Okay. Did, did anybody see uh, what somebody put up on YouTube to the theme of Jesse's Girl? <laughs> you have got to see this because just from the moment that Mark and I are jogging, we look gay. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to run, but the Jesse's Girl, I'm like. <laughs> The audition, right? And it's like, you know, I live in Hollywood, not my let's go gay with it. Let's like let's get real with it, you know? He did a movie with Grace Jones. I don't know. <laughs> I mean I'm I, I know about Grace, so anyway. Well, I mean, a lot of the movie there were moments, especially for Mark, where you were very scantily clad. I mean there's there's a lot of moments there. I mean, was there any self-consciousness in the beginning, or did you both know, no, we're hot enough, it's totally okay, I don't care, taking my shirt off all the time? Oh no, oh no, oh no. My stunt double's name was Danny, and Danny and Robert's stunt double were you know, but they were really good-looking guys, and I mean, they built like they were like Navy Seals. And Ken, he's looking good, and like I like in the if you notice in the scene, I like the body, and like. I'm so gay, really. I mean, honest to God, I had like body issues. So I was like, I, in the locker room, I'm like trying to hide myself behind the locker door because his body's so great. And I'm like, and I'm like leaning there, and I'm like, all I can think of is like, oh, I'm fat. You know what I mean? So, uh, so, but then 
I knew, you know, I mean, I knew I was driving a really good car, that like it, God had given me a good thing to ride around in, and, uh, and the underwear, but I got mad at the costume designer because I got all the costume budget. I mean, those were hot clothes in the age. By the way, they all came from Fred Siegel's and they cost a lot of money. And I had to have like five of every shirt, or seven of every shirt, or ten of every shirt. And, uh, um, but she wouldn't give me Calvin Klein underwear. And I wanted Calvin Klein underwear because I was like, I know a boy, it's like a wonder drop for a boy, right? <laughs> so, and I knew they were going to see my stuff. But, you know, and I'm not, like, I'm an actor, so like when boys get out of bed, and like, and the camera's rolling, you're, like, you're going to adjust yourself, you know what I mean, to make sure you look good, you know? So, and I didn't expect him to keep it in the movie. And the weirdest thing I've ever signed is a guy came to me, he was really nice, and he was very polite, and he said, look, this movie broke at 26 minutes and 36 seconds, because I paused it so many times, which is signed. <laughs> And I, you know, and I, I chose to take it as a compliment. So, <laughs> so, Robert, have you had any underwear pictures that people have brought to you, just out of curiosity in general? <laughs> uh, even before I was an actor. Uh. <laughs> uh, you know, what's funny for me too is like in all the most macho scenes. Like, first of all, we're, one of the first uh, uh, pieces that we shot was uh, the high school, and so uh, right away, like when we went to play baseball. Uh, the director was like, just before you go to hit the ball, just shake your ass a little bit. And I was like, dude, I never played baseball like that. <laughs> and he's like, well, just try it. So if you remember, I go like this, and I shake my ass. Oh, man, that feels good. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then when we get into the fight, he's like, the first thing I want you to do is tackle him and pull his pants down. And I was like, dude! <laughs> I didn't, well, once, but let's not talk about that. I was nine, I was experimental stage, but anyway, and then, like, every little thing that would start to come in would be, uh, suspect. Well, the rewrites were amazing. I mean, it's like, I went to Jack, actually, the director, and I said, I think the guy that's writing this is more retarded. <laughs> like, that scene, like, when we're in the bedroom, and he goes, like, oh, yeah, there's something that's way to get inside your body if it's a girl in the cabana, and I'm like, the only way she could get inside my body is if she had a big dildo. I mean, it's like, I don't know. But I'm thinking this when I'm 24 years old. Cover those ears! Cover those ears. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, the, Here, but I really thought, like, what is he writing? I mean, this is like, it's insane stuff, because it just doesn't make any sense. And that still doesn't make any sense to me. But my actual, my favorite part of Nightmare on Elm Street, and I will put our part, I will be honest about put our Nightmare on Elm Street up against anybody else's. And like, and you know, I think it's just as good. It's different, but it's just as good. And the, the thing is, but from the minute I enter this bedroom, so the minute I throw the glove at the mirror and the mirror cracks and Robert is laughing at me in the mirror, is some of the most eloquent Nightmare on Elm Street stuff, I think, ever of the whole series. I don't think Robert's ever been scary. I don't think he's ever been. And we were like really in tune with each other. And I think that whole Grady's death and transformation into the scene, I think it's beautiful. I still think it's beautiful. And I, I looked. I was in San Francisco, and they did a big screening down in uh, a big, huge theater, 1,400 people, and I and people came out to me afterwards and like was like, you know what, that is a really good movie. And I remember it when I was 13 as being a really bad movie, but you know. Well, I mean, not to not to get things too serious around here, trying to keep it lighthearted, but is it funny for you now coming to these shows and finding people that this movie is something that's very serious to them? It's not that, even though there are funny moments, but this whole franchise is something that's very deep to a lot of us. Is that hard to sort of relate to, in, in a sense, for either of you? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, you know... I'm talking to you like a little bit. We... we, we I, hello! <laughs> screening was in New York City and I had always gone to horror films where the audience goes don't go in the house or run but when, when you go to New York City and you watch the screening they're like fuck them up Freddy <laughs> Wait 
a minute, you guys are supposed to be cheering for me to get out. <laughs> and, and the table's turning. Times Square, they're like, we, 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 more blood! <laughs> you know, Nightmare on Elm Street opened uh, on Halloween. And by uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, every theater in New York was sold out for the entire day. And, uh, and I was in New York with Robert, and we went to maybe 20 different theaters. Robert went to a different theater than I did. Kim went to all over town. And, but I went with my high school girlfriend to the very first showing of the big screen in Times Square. Now, it's that, that started at 10 o'clock in the morning. And there was this guy sitting in front of us, and he was just, he didn't smoke in the theaters then. And he was like smoking like one joint after another. And he's like talking to the screen. I mean, he's having a relationship with her. And he's like, fucker, you know, like, he's like doing all that kind of stuff. And I said to Susan, who was, I grew up with, I said, at the end, I said, do you think I should say something to him? You know what I mean? Because I'm sitting right behind him. And he's high, really high as a kite. So, like, so I tapped him with his shoulder. And he was like, turned around to say something. And, and I, it was the most hysterical thing. You can do it. Spring is not being like, he worried about it. No, no, I'm going to you go. OK, so that, you can imagine what the guy looked like. It was unbelievable. And that was the last time I ever saw it in the theater that people didn't know who I was. And so it was like, it was really fun. <laughs> You know, one thing that I was curious about is all the work with Marshall Bell, because he seemed closeted a little bit in that movie. Um, Child molesting yeah, murderer. I think so, yeah. In like, defense, he's an asshole. <laughs> That's what I was actually going to ask. Is he like that in real life? Because I've never met the guy. No, Marshall is so cool, and we're, we're friends to this day. In fact, I just worked with Marshall again in a little teaser that I directed. And, and, and Marshall, we became fast friends on the set, and uh, I would listen to him. I was 19. I had just finished my first movie, Weird Science. Yeah. That's the Weird Science salute for, these, for those of you that don't know. It's like, ah. ah. Uh, and I, and I, I would hear Marshall next door doing all kinds of improper things. And I went to his dressing room and I was like, dude, are, are you okay? And he was like, yes. <laughs> and uh, needless to say, over the years, we, we started getting tighter. We started uh, hanging out and partying. And, and, and Robert Downey Jr. and I are friends. And we still see each other all the time. And in fact, I saw Marshall at Robert's uh, last birthday party. And a funny story about that is uh, Marshall and I got together. We're like, what do you get for the guy who's got everything, you know? And I was like, well, I'm going to get him this really cool fedora. I'm going to go downtown. I'm going to get the sick fedora. I'm going to put it in a nice box. I'm going to give it to him for his birthday. I'm all proud of it because it's not something he would buy for himself. So, you know, we, we go into the party in his new house. And long story short, I, I put the, the box with the fedora in it on the, on the, on the table with all his gifts. And about 15 minutes into the party, uh, Jamie Foxx gets on this microphone and says, I want everybody to take a look over to the south wing of the lawn. And, and these two caballeros were walking two horses, a his and hers horse for Robert and his wife. And he was like, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife goes, where are you going? I go, I'm going to go get that fucking fedora back. <laughs> But, but getting back to Marshall, like Marshall is a sweetheart, he's, he's really cool. You know, it's usually the opposite of what actors play. Like, uh, for instance, uh, you know, I always play like these hung to these heroes, and I'm just not that at all. I am such a geek. My, my wife and my sons, they constantly make fun of me because I embarrass my family constantly. <laughs> can, you, can you go figure? His dad's just like that. Right. Okay. Dad. And then, and then Marshall, he always plays these kind of hard-nosed, kind of rugged guys, but he's just a big teddy bear. He really is. You know, and the funny thing about Marshall is, like, a lot of people don't know this, but Marshall's wife is one of the most famous set designers in the world. And, I mean, like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Get off the stage. <laughs> Get 
back to you. Everybody say bye, Dad! Bye, Dad! I'll tell you a little bit, Pop. That's what acting is all about. You know, his father didn't just come. Right. We sat that phone before we walked in. No, I was gonna say about, I was gonna say about Marshall is that uh, his wife is a famous, 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 famous woman. And Marshall, A Nightmare on Elm Street was Marshall's second movie. And Marshall's first movie was Birdie. And Alan Parker was at their house for dinner and said, you'd be a great actor and put it in the movie Birdie. And so I thought he was like this big successful actor. It wasn't until right later I realized that this was his second movie. And uh, he went on, you know, he's made hundreds and hundreds of films now. And uh, he, he, was, he is a, a really wonderful person. I mean, like, really, I think like, when you go out on the circuit and whatnot, I think the Nightmare on Elm Street people are really nice. I mean, I think all the Nightmare on Elm Street people are nice. But I think that Nightmare on Elm Street 2 people are the nicest people. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah. you, know, you have fun when you come to the table. All of us come because we actually enjoy being here. And we like the fans and all that kind of stuff. And, and Clue is the same. I mean, Clue is absolutely nuts. That's funny because that was my next question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he's, he's nuts. You go. Well, see, here's the thing. See, recent, in recent years, when I watch documentaries that Clue is in, he seems like a man possessed, like insanely crazy, but in a fun way. Was he like that back then? Well, you know. As you guys know, Clue had already had a really long career. He was already a major motion picture star, a TV star, was really experienced, and was really humble about it. And when, when we were working together, uh, Clue was a, a very much of an intellectual. Everything must break down to some sort of science, even the art of acting. And I was like, um, but yeah, but you got to remember your lines first, buddy. Um, <laughs> And, but, but working with Clue and Hope, which Mark got to work with them a lot more, but you know, just getting to, to be with them on the set and at lunchtime and, and, and uh, having the, uh, you know, the ability to be able to talk with them was, was, was such a wonderful gift for someone like me because Weird Science was uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2 was my second movie as well. So being able to work with such pros like, like, like uh, Hope and Clue uh, and, uh, and uh, what was the other? Oh, that was another movie. Anyway, um, <laughs> and then you know, getting back original too. When it was really funny because this was Clue. When we went to a screening together uh, and a Q and A of Nightmare Two in Hollywood, um, we had, the, the movie had just played, and Clue and I got up in front, like Mark and I are here before you. And uh, the first question was, you know, because they didn't ask any questions first. They introduced us, and they said, "We open the floor for questions." And this girl her hand really fast. And she said, yes. She said, um, um, did you guys know it was a gay movie when you made the movie? <laughs> and Clue, and I just go, Clue? And, 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 and Clue was like, well, you know, I, at first, you know, the, uh, the subtext behind the motive of the, and I was like, give me the microphone. We are like, hell yeah, we did, bitch! <laughs> whispered in my ear, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> he was like sweating on that one. They were all sweating on that one. I tell you, when I came back to, I, you know, I quit acting after this. And uh, they came and found me. It took them two years to find me to do Never Sleep Again. And when I found out, I didn't know. I mean, I would Google myself once in a while. But I didn't like to know about any of this. I mean, I had like a whole different life. And uh, so when I came back, they said, you know, they call you the Brother Garbo of Four. <laughs> oh, you hated that. I loved it. I was like, they were like, you want to go on tour? And I was like, the first place I went was Amsterdam. And, and, uh, and uh, so they, uh, when they start, when all these conversations started and all this kind of Excuse stuff. Excuse me, where are you going? He's going to get Robert England to sign his picture. The hell with Robert England! Sit down! Uh, yeah, but I wanted to talk about hope, actually. We really love Robert a lot. Um, you know, Hope... Hope... Hope had won an Academy Award. Hope was a major world star. And she also took five hours to get her hair done. As in some days it was a five martini hairdo, and sometimes it was a three martini hairdo. And one day she invited me out to lunch to talk about show business. And she insisted that I have martinis with her. 
And uh, the, that's the scene where, when the police bring me to the house, is the second day of shooting. And five weeks later, when I step through the door, that's me and Hope coming home from lunch, when I have the blanket wrapped around me. And, and the costume director said, they're drunk. They're both drunk. And I, I wasn't drunk. I mean, she was drunk. But I mean, she was maintenance, you know. And, uh, but they, uh, they were so professional and so wonderful that they would like, she could be like a little drunk and like walk in and just get it. She was fabulous. I mean, I had so many cool moms in my career. I was like, Maude Adams, I had like Pussy Galore was my mom. Tuesday Well was my mom. Sandy Dennis was my mom. I, Dina Merrill, the richest woman in the world, was my mom. I mean, like, I always got the good moms. And but Hope is my favorite. I'm trying to find a way to say this that's not in a way that has been asked a million times, but I mean, at the time you were making this, it was just another job for the most part. Did, did you have any inkling at any point you'd be sitting here, you know, however many years later and, yes. and talking to people about yes. this? <laughs> when do you think was the first moment you were like, oh God, maybe this is something important? Well, you know, actually, the first nightmare had already come out, and uh, Mark and I talked about it, even I think in the audition. We knew that this was a great opportunity for a couple of young actors like ourselves. Um, nightmare One had a great cast. Um, it, had, uh, it did really well at the box office. And as you guys know, there had not been an iconic, psychotic character like Freddy Krueger in a long time. I mean, only in America can a perverted, psychopathic, child molesting murderer be a hero. <laughs> and we were like, yeah, Freddy, I think. Uh, in all fairness, he was just a child killer. Well, no, they took out the child molesting. They, did, they took the Don't child molesting. Don't try to tell us about Nightmare <laughs> 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 I just like to give you a hard time, Robert. He, he was a child He was originally a child molester. But you know, the funny thing, I'm going to tell you this. And I wanted to, there were a couple things I wanted to tell you when we got in here. Is he actually was the first person hired for the movie. And I was the second. They hired him first, they hired me second, then they let us pick Kim. And then Kim and I chose Sydney to play Carrie. And the, actually the very last person hired for Nightmare on Elm Street 2, of course, was Robert England, because they weren't going to use him. And they started filming without him. You know what I mean? 50 bucks an autograph, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's how it got. And, like, and he put him in a position of incredible, incredible flower, which later in the series would play out because the stronger and more powerful Robert got, the more the movie became about Fred, as opposed to about what the first one, two, and three were about. But it was the worst mistake they've ever made, not doing him right, because he could negotiate any salary he wanted, which was good for him. And you know what's cool about working with Robert is uh, one of my first days working with him, he, uh, you know, I hadn't met him yet. I had seen the movie. I was really excited that he was on board. Uh, I was, I was really impressed because I, I grew up watching horror movies my whole life. I mean, that's what I did with my grandpa on the weekends. We went to the triple feature downtown LA, and we watched all the old greats like Mark and I were talking about yesterday. You know, Rosemary's Baby and Last House on the Left and the Abominable Doctor Fives. Carrot. There you go. And uh, so working with Robert, like I was really excited. And so I'm in the makeup room. Like, again, you guys, I'm, I'm 19. It's my second movie. I'm stoked. You know? I'm, I'm, did I say stoked or stoked? <laughs> stoked. I'm stoked. And uh, Robert comes in, and he's the nicest guy. Just totally hospitable and cordial and sweet and thoughtful. Hey, can I get you something? Oh, no, thank you. You know? And then uh, about an hour or two into makeup, I tried to reciprocate. And I said, hey, Robert, can I get you a coffee? Fuck off! Because <laughs> when he started getting his makeup on, man, I started getting into character. I was like, oh, take the picture, bitch. I was, like, I was like, oh, I was like, method acting. I was like, well, yeah, you go fuck off. <laughs> and he just looked at me with his, you know, because he's good at it. He just looked over at me, and I was like, I think I'll just fuck off. <laughs> See, I was lucky with him because, like, I came off Nightmare on Elm Street. I came off the comeback in the five and I'm Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean. So I had just worked with Robert Alden, and I'd just been in Cannes Film Festival and Cher, Kathy Bates, <laughs> Karen Rock, Sandy Dennis. I mean, I was like, it was a big deal, you know? I mean, it was like worldwide fame. So I was like on equal footing, do you know what I mean? So I was like, I was afraid. And, uh, uh, I just worked with Robert Downey Jr., Bill Paxton, John Hughes. But you have to remember. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> I want to tell you that at the time he worked with Robert Downey Jr., Robert Downey Jr. and Sarah Jessica Parker were my dog sitters in my house for six weeks and years. And I, they, I came back from Europe for, and they were in my house for six weeks. And my house was so trash. And the dogs had peed all of everything. So when he was working with Robert Downey Jr., Robert Downey Jr. was sleeping on my couch. And I was sitting on the top of the highway. And I love Robert too, actually, a lot. I just want to give time any more name dropping. We should just get it out of the way now. <laughs> well, we just do it all. I sleep on Robert's couch now. That's right. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> well, actually, Robert likes to sleep on other people's couches too. Hey! Oh, sleep burn. Hey, who's Robert sheets? I think I'll crack. <laughs> You did. It's going to go on YouTube. You know it is. Somebody's going to have to inform him. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll leave the nightmare questions for the fans in a second. But one thing that I'm always curious of, maybe fans are too, what would you say in coming to these conventions, what is the most weird moment you have had? Creepiest, craziest fan, or most awesome fan? Just weird moment that may have happened. Well, for me, I'd be really honest with you. Uh, I like besides the man they brought me the tape, and I and I do have people who come and bring me underwear on occasion, and I just I don't sign underwear by the way, not even if they're in a new package. And then uh, well, I do do private dances though for about the the, the weirdest I had like I have like a lot of people like sort of break down, and I, I and like honestly you you guys you know I mean I've done two movies. Three in my life. I'm not a big star. I'm just, I'm really a person who lives in Mexico and is very fortunate that I was in two, like, fabulous movies. And, uh, but a little boy started crying and shaking and he passed out and cried. Um, and, and when they picked him, I was in Denver, Colorado, and he said, you, you know, you changed my life. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, break my, and I give most of the money that I made to charity, to the Trevor Project, or It Gets Better, uh, which is a suicide prevention organization for gay and lesbian teenagers. And, uh, and I do it. And, and I can honor that people like tell me their secrets. On my, my Facebook page is fabulous. And then like people tell me their secrets. And you know, I get emails from guys who are 15 years old and they're married and they're going, I made a huge mistake. And I loved you when I was 16. And what do I do? I mean, what do you do with that? You know what I mean? You just, you just like, you just like kind of be sweet on it and say, you know what? Like, I got, I, I think I got put here for a reason. I'm a good person for this job, you know. And uh, for me, that's it. Really, that's what it's all about. It's just like I love the fans. I mean, I really enjoy. I'm not BSing you, and I, you don't have to pay me twenty dollars for me to say this. I love when you guys come up to the table. I don't care if you have the money or you don't. And if you don't have any money for me to sign something, please come and talk to me. Because it's like, that's why I'm here. That's why I got a plane and flew to talk to you guys. And that's it. You know, just have fun. It's for me, if you don't have any money, don't bother coming up to my table. <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard that bullshit before. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but no grifters. I know, don't come and grift Because I know a grifter myself. I mean, I'll, on a serious note, look, we have fun. This is a great job. It's a lot of hard work, but you know what? There's, there's, there's so many uh, rewards to it, and, and there's so much value and, and fulfillment in, in doing what you love to do because you know what we do is an art. And but the greatest gift back has been the ability to do what Mark said is give back. You know, I've done a lot of charity work for. Uh, Make a wish, March of Dimes, but the the most fabulous. Well, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll fucking cry right now if I want to. This is my Q and A. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> Our Q and A. Sorry, Mark. Oh, that was the uh, Easter Bunny at the uh, terminally ill uh, ward for children at the at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Whoo! I had no idea what I was getting into. So it was Easter, and I put on the Easter Bunny outfit, and man, I walk in there with the Easter Bunny outfit, hello, right? I got my age, and I'm getting it, and all of a sudden I went into this one word, 
and I saw these kids with their families struggling to survive. And I just, I just, it just dawned on me like how much I take for granted in my life, how ungrateful that I've been at times in my life, and, and what a gift it is to be able to utilize not only this wonderful opportunity to be an actor and make money and travel the world and work with people like Mark and all the wonderful people that I've worked with, but to have moments like this where what you do actually puts you in a position to help others on a really grand level with golf tournaments and tennis tournaments. And, and for Christ's sake, uh, Richard Brico and I, and, and I think it was uh, Richard Brico, Johnny Depp, Holly Robinson, Pete and I raised something like $60,000 in an hour of signing for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And, was, and my mom was so proud of me. My mom, when she rest in peace, was so proud of me. She says the, the proudest moment of, of her life is when I would go to do those charity events and I would come back and she would see all the people that were able to affect and she would say, I'm so proud of you, son. <laughs> you know he's lying to you, right? On, the, on that note, I just want to know, this is the last serious thing, that we're going to ask questions and we're going to have a lot of fun. But I will say this. I, over the course of the last two years, and some of you know, and like I've been like talking about um, what we were holy and all that kind of stuff. It's really important to me, building up to talking about HIV. And I did a, uh, I'm on the cover of The Advocate this month, and I'm on the CNN News banner scroll, because I came out as having HIV, living with HIV. And I thought, that's no big deal. And then I looked on Wikipedia, and there's 100 people in the world that have said that, who are notables. And it got picked up around the world. And that glove, this glove, let me pick up, and they took a picture of me with this glove, and it went all over the world. And it's like, and people who don't generally hear things that I talk about um, heard about it. And I'm, I'm being interviewed by the Huffington Post on Monday. Now, that's from a movie that's 30 years old, and that's the power of that. And I squeezed every last <laughs> drop of blood I could out of this thing to, uh, to do something good with it, you know? And, because uh, God has blessed me so richly, you know what I mean? And it's like really, I mean really, really rich. I live in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. You know, I live on a beach, and it, I have, I'm married, to a wonderful man, unbelievable to me. You know what I mean? I lived through a deadly illness. You know, I'm standing here talking to you, and uh, and people are paying me to sign a piece of paper. You know, and if I don't know that I'm one of the most blessed people in the world, then I'm the fucking retard. <laughs> to let you guys ask some questions before we move on to the next panel. Because if somebody who's a pretty big deal is here to do it, I believe Sean Clark's panel is next, or is that? Oh, it is. Celebrity Sean Clark in the back. Can we get a round of applause now? Do I scream? Can you still do it? Oh, yeah, I can do it. Watch this, watch this. Go no, wait a minute. Okay, okay now I'm going to tell you what. Okay, I scream for money. And I scream for charity. So I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to scream for you, but I want each one of you to walk by his place or my place and give me a dollar. 
okay? If I'm on screen, because I don't screen for less than 500 bucks. And I'm on the app, it's less than 1,000. <laughs> so if, you, if I do this for you, because I really, honest to God, I never do this, and I'm about to lose my voice. I want to see some dollar bills pile up on this. <laughs> you can put them in his pants, and you can put them in a box on my table. <laughs>